Hi, I'm Marie Elizabeth Molly, and this is Relationship Alchemy. Today, we're going to talk about the alchemy of empathy with Dr. Kristen Donnelly. She's a four-time TEDx speaker. In fact, we have shared the stage twice together, and she's an international empathy educator and researcher with two decades of experience in helping people understand the beauty and difference and the power in inclusivity. She is one of the good doctors of Abbey Research and COO of their parent company, which is a family business that's been around for decades. And she's an unapologetic nerd for stories of change, as am I. Kristen lives outside of Philadelphia with her husband, where they are surrounded by piles of books and several video game consoles. I love that we are both partnered up with nerds. They are the best. Welcome, Kristen. Marie Elizabeth, thank you so much for having me. This is a delight. I'm so excited to get to talk with you today because ever since we first met, I've been so fascinated by your work on empathy in particular. So could you start by just saying, how do you define empathy according to your research? I would be only so delighted. After a lot of research, including literally combing dictionaries and also consulting social science research and just some common sense, Erin and I have come to define empathy as an intentional choice to understand yourself and others instead of make assumptions about them. So it's an oh. intentional, consistent choice to understand, to seek understanding rather than making assumptions. That is so powerful because it feels like we are in a time where people are making more assumptions and are more polarized than ever. So could you speak to how that relates now? For sure. And I'll say it feels that way because we have the fear machines in our, that we carry around in our pockets, but I promise this is not the worst time. Like I say all the time, I teach on historical Christianity. We used to literally murder each other if we didn't agree. So like, we're doing okay. Like we're doing, we're, it's not quite as fraught as it feels. Um, it's not great. Uh, but we have a lot of reasons for it not to be great. And one of those is the biosocial kind of thing in our bodies and our instincts and our history that says, if we don't recognize something, it's dangerous. Oh. And there are some really beautiful things that protect us and, and from that. The problem is our biology hasn't caught up to how we live our lives. So when we were like in the middle of the forest, that was super duper helpful because it was like, oh, that's not a human, that's a bear. I should be scared. But now we see other humans that don't look like us or think like us or function like us. And we have somewhat the same like biological psychosocial reaction. This is all obviously like big grains of like big broad brushes here. It is hard work to go against that biological urge. It's hard work to say, you know what, instead of fear, I'm gonna choose trust, or I'm at least gonna choose curiosity. I am gonna go against centuries and millennia of the way that my people or my body or my soul or my family has said the world works. And I'm gonna choose something different. It's hard, it's really hard. And a lot of us are tired. The other thing that we have that no other people in history have had is, a, is nowhere to escape the messages easily. So everybody else has had a physical safe place, you know, in some way or some fashion or something where you could be expected to unplug, to not be with anyone else, to be alone with your thoughts. Think of how much strategy it takes right now to be alone and not like alone, like not like during COVID, but like when you really need to not know what's happening in the world, it's difficult and still have freedom of movement and freedom of choice and freedom of everything else. For you to live your life on your own terms is difficult. And I think it's more difficult than ever because we can't ever escape everyone else's voices. That is so true. And so how do you suggest someone get started on that shift on, uh, out of the biology of fear and danger and othering into choice? into curiosity as a first step? There's two pathways I would suggest. One is if you are somebody who loves to consume like documentaries or movies or anything else, pick a topic or podcasts, books. If you, if you are a, a art consumer, pick a topic and find a piece of art that speaks to that topic that you've never thought about before. 
So for instance, if you are somebody listening to this who has never thought about the uh, Americans with physical disabilities, if you've never considered the Americans with Disabilities Act, because you don't know anyone who's physically disabled in your life or whatever, there is a brilliant documentary. It's on Netflix. It's called Crip Camp. And an hour and a half of your life, you're going to live with someone else. You're going to learn something different. And you're going to see the world through their eyes for 90 minutes. Start there. Because then what's going to happen is as you're moving through things, you'll be walking along the street and be like, that's not wheelchair friendly. Hmm. Judy couldn't get in that building. That's not ADA compliant. And it'll just be these little bugs because the more you spend time on someone else's shoes, the more you automatically, you've rewritten some pathways in your brain and your brain can be like, oh, that person's part of the safe tribe. So now I will start acknowledging the ways that our life needs to accommodate theirs. So it can be a really simple, tiny choice. The other thing is if you are not a consumer of things, I don't understand this, but I'm told there are people. (laughs) I've heard there's such a thing. If you would rather talk to people than than read or watch or listen, think about one of your close friends, maybe not your like bosom soul buddy, maybe not your partner, but this could be your partner too. And think about a question you've never asked them. Thinking about an opinion you've never entertained and ask. So for instance, my, um, one of my really good friends, her mom, uh, she's one of my best friends. She was one of the maids of honor. Like she was my emotional maid of honor in my wedding. Um, her mom had polio and my whole time I've known Katie Penny walked on crutches. I've never actually asked Katie what it was like to grow up in, 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 in the eighties and nineties with a mom with crutches, never actually asked her. So the next time I see Katie, that's one of the things I'm going to ask is like, hey, I'd love to know what that was like. Did you ever get picked on? Did any of the kids ever make fun of your mom? What, what was that? What was that like? I know this thing, but I've never investigated it. I've never chased the curiosity. So that's one way. And if you're talking about the person you do intimate life with, you could be thinking like, oh, I know everything or any question I ask could open this really ugly can of worms. It doesn't have to. It can be something like, what like maybe you've never talked about what their favorite food was as a kid or maybe you've never like maybe the two of you could start watching a new sport together or maybe the two of you could learn to do something together like you know what we've never thought about doing taking a pottery class let's go reenact ghost like there's lots of ways <laughs> that as you do that stories will come out you guys will talk about how embarrassed you are together or oh this reminds me of that time in shop class this like it's it's those kind of things. If you activate something, other things activate within us. I love that. And it reminds me of uh, an assignment or, or a gift I often give to people, which is to pick up a deck of question cards. Because sometimes it can be hard in the moment to think of a question. I love the example you gave because it's very specific and it's based on something you've noticed about your friend's life. And so that's an easy entry. But if you're with your partner who you've been with, maybe for a long time, and you may think you know everything, even though people are very mysterious and there's always vast caverns of mystery that we have not yet touched. I maintain that. Uh, These question cards can give an entry point where you don't have to come up with it. You just pull the card from the deck and you agree, is this a question we want to ask each other or not? And then you have a conversation over dinner that's spurred by that question. And like one of my favorite decks is by a company called The Skin Deep. And they do a lot of work with this kind of thing about people understanding each other and being able to connect across lines of historical difference, for example. I love that. My husband and I don't have question decks, but we um, we have spent a lot of time in our lives standing in line at Disney World. And (laughs) there's been it's been a significant part of our marriage has been standing in line. And something that we've started doing is, is either like Googling a funny word or like flipping through Flipboard or something and like turning the phone to the person and be like, what do you think about that? And it can spur this whole different, we had this like 45 minute conversation once about the definition of the word lollygag and where we (laughs) thought it came from and would like, if I used it, he's Northern Irish, I should say, which Marie Elizabeth knows and the rest of you listeners don't, but like, we have to play with, we can play with language a lot, the two of us, and we can play with childhood things a lot, the two of us, because even though 
like he, we have some childhood overlap because America is everywhere. There's huge <laughs> chunks of our childhoods that don't overlap at all, even pop culture. So I'll make a punky Brewster joke and he has no idea who that is. So like, okay, let's go to the YouTube, but they got Fraggle Rock. So we can both sing the entire Fraggle Rock theme song. So it's, it's, there's some, e I have it easier in that way than some of the rest of you do. And I, I admit that, but I think the question decks are great. If you're somewhere without a question deck, like, gosh, go back to childhood games, play I spy, like figure yes. out something that just sparks a conversation and then chase it and see where it takes you. And if it's awkward at first, most things we're learning to do are awkward at first. It doesn't mean it's not worth it or that it won't get more comfortable. Oh, that's so gorgeous. I've heard you speak on tolerance before, and I'd love for you to talk about the link or difference between empathy and tolerance, because I love your perspective in particular on tolerance, and I want people to get to hear it. Oh, thank you. I think tolerance is absolute garbage. Um, so, and I say that because what tolerance really does is flatten the other person into the dominant stereotype we can make about them. It removes their humanity from them. So you can easily diagnose somebody, you can dissect somebody based on the most apparent thing. They aren't a human being, they're a woman wearing a hijab. They aren't a human being, they're a guy with no legs. They're not a human being, they're a homeless person. Empathy instead is the disciplinary choice. It is a mindset, it's a worldview. Pick the thing that makes sense to you. Pick the word that you resonate with. But it is an entire framework through which we move through the world, by which we move through the world, that centers humanity. So this isn't just two white ladies who wear glasses and have brown hair having conversations. This is Marie Elizabeth the human and Kristen the human. And we have a lot of places of overlap, which we know because we've been friends now for almost a year. Oh my gracious, what a gift. Um, but A, we have so much more to learn about each other. And B, we have so many places that the other person doesn't touch. Yeah. So if I just say, oh, Marie Elizabeth's the one that takes photographs, that skips a gajillion things about you. <laughs> and like, or even more derivative, Marie Elizabeth's the one, the one in a mixed relationship. Mm -hmm. Well, what does that actually say about you and Patrick? It doesn't actually say anything. It just reduces you down to the thing that categorizes you as an other. Yes. It reduces you down to a bumper sticker instead of your humanity. So when, so when we teach tolerance at Abbey Research, what we actually ask people to do is think about inclusivity. We also don't love the idea of diversity as a goal. And this is a thing that goes with empathy too. So diversity is not a goal, it's a reality. We are all diverse mm -hmm. human beings. Yes. We're all diverse. We all carry lots of things within us. And if that idea makes you uncomfortable, it's probably because somebody sold you the lie that when we say diversity, we just mean racial diversity. Yes. And the thing is, we don't. We have to mean all the diversity. We have to mean all of the facets of humanity. And the more I study this, the more I realize I keep leaving ones out. So like, I've got a standard list of ones we list, but like I realized a couple of weeks ago, we never ever say if you've served in the military, mm. which is a major intersection. We've yeah. never talked about if you've lost somebody to addiction, which is a major intersection, or if you yourself are in recovery. Like we all have all of these things within us. And so empathy is the key to inclusivity, which is really what we want. And inclusivity is the, ter is the idea that everybody gets to show up to any conversation, any relationship, any job on their own emotional terms. Mm. They're never a token. They're never forced to only bring one perspective. They show up on their terms about who they are as a full human. That is hard ass work to get there. But the first step is having the curiosity to ask the questions and get to know and have the empathy to understand beneath the tolerant stereotypes. I see what you're talking about as having such huge implications for how we do business with each other yep. and how we set up our, our teams and our businesses. If we have multiple people in the business, how that gets set up, because historically it's been very one note, like everybody has to conform to this one stereotype. The women got to put on the suits, can't show too much cleavage, et cetera, et cetera. You know, folks who come from a different culture have to learn how to talk white, <laughs> you know, it, it all, right? And so to have uh, businesses based on this 
practice of empathy and curiosity and the permission to be in there on your own terms while serving the the purpose and the function of the larger business feels revolutionary. It is, which is one of the reasons it hasn't happened yet. So yeah. the thing, one of the questions I get all the time is like, there's lots of, there's actually so much data that more diverse organizations are bet, are more financially successful. They're more innovative. They have more stability. They have more sustainability. Why aren't we doing it? Mm. And the answer is that somebody has to start giving up power. Yeah. So as a business owner, and as a leader, one of the things I have to do, and we are nowhere near achieving an empathetic workforce. I try very hard to be an empathetic leader. We try very hard to be empathetic owners and understand all of our people. But the other thing is I, I employ people, I don't employ automatrons. So there's still conflict between folks. There's still people who don't like each other. There's still people that might be in the wrong position, but I'm not gonna do anything about it because like they're good at it. And to move them would be just too, uh, it's exhausting. Mm -hmm. Like we're all still human around here. Yeah. And so we're all figuring it out. But I will say that I've found that when you treat people like people, they tend to act like people. That's Which my experience too. <laughs> means they show their loyalty has increased. They show up in their in their best selves because they want to. No one very I shouldn't say no one because I don't I don't like general statements. Very very few people want to be miserable at their job. Mm -hmm. There are definitely some people that do, but there are very few people that want to be miserable. And so I see leadership and ownership. Our job is to create the environment in which they can be their best selves, whatever that definition is. And then at us, we're B2B. And so it's my job to create the environment where they can serve their, our customers the best possible. If, my, if our customers never know my name, gosh, I've done my job. Mm. Like they don't need to know who I am. They don't need to know anything. I only step in when people are being abusive to, to our employees. Like that's pretty much it. Um, I'm the last, I'm, I'm one of the last lines of defense as it were. And then I get very protective because if you're not gonna treat my person like a human, we're going to have words about that because they're a human and we don't speak like that to people. Um, but I see lots of millennials and Gen X and Gen Z pushing back against that old mold. We mm -hmm. were in colleges where we were on teams with tons of different people. We grew up in elementary schools that um, English wasn't the first language for half our class. We have learned the power of inclusivity I like not to use that word again but we've learned that power we've learned that I don't have to eat meat and potatoes every day because that's what my mom cooked I can yes. also enjoy injera and I can learn how to make tamales and I can figure out exactly I can learn the rules of cricket and enjoy it like I can be a planetary human yes and we want to bring that into the workforce but honestly people have to see their power and that's scary yeah. as hell so like it you is. as a white man have to think the person I'm hiring if I have a white man and a black woman candidate and they're both equal, you have to intentionally sit there and think I better hire, like I need to, for the longevity of the organization, hire the black woman. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter what the social consequences are that you didn't hire the white guy. That might mean you don't have the seat of the country club anymore. That might mm -hmm. mean you don't have these other power structures, but for the longevity yeah. of your business, if they are equally, if we're talking apples to apples. Yep. Yeah you got to pick the different perspective. You've got to pick the different story. And that's a power. That's a decision to say, I'm going to leverage my power for the privilege of others. And if you have always had power and you've never investigated what it's like to not have power, God, Marie Elizabeth, how are you even going to know you're supposed to do that? Like exactly like knee jerk of like, oh, well, of course I'm going to hire the person that looks like me because who, I know who's like me because we went to the same schools and blah, 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 yeah. blah, blah. Yeah. So we, every time somebody who looks different than everybody else in the room, somebody who thinks different, has a different experience, who has different genitalia, who has different pronouns, every time there's a ha like a hint of difference in the room, we're one step closer to that, to that understanding of business being based on humanity. Absolutely. hundred percent with you. So, and what flashes for me in what you're talking about is even if we are able to create a culture like this in our businesses, how many of us actually create a culture like this at home with our partner? <laughs> because it feels to me, you know, because I have conversations about intimate and personal relationships mm -hmm. every day, and it feels like that's the final frontier <laughs> somehow. It's where we're supposed to be 
the most loved and extend the most love, but it also feels like it's where we extend the least amount of grace. Yeah. And so would you say a word about how do we apply empathy in our relationships, not in a way that we just give somebody blanket permission, you know, because then they're crossing our boundaries and, and maybe the relationship doesn't serve our needs if we don't make any rules or, you know, terms of engagement or anything right. like that. Right. But how do we cultivate more empathy, more curiosity, more spaciousness within our intimate relationships, which is where we tend to get the tightest? This is why people hire you, Marie Elizabeth. Yeah. I'm not. Well, yes. Um, I, I mean, this is. <laughs> I'm just I can curious from your research. Have you noticed something like from your research? To a certain extent, yeah. I mean, I think what we, what I have noticed in people. Um, and I see this more in friendships than in, um, than in, I see this more in covenantal friendships than in um, marriages in particular, mostly because people don't talk to me about their marriages, but they'll talk to me about their friends. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. And something that I've, I've noticed is that we all, we don't talk about personality differences as diversity as often as we should. And so like, we tend to like narrow everything down to love languages. We don't like really, like I joked with my husband that like everybody in premarital counseling should be required to do strengths finders and have yes. a strengths finders analysis, like actually. Um, and Agreed. <laughs> and th that we don't talk enough about when this behavior is happening, it's not personal. It's how I respond to things. It's that kind of thing. A lot of it is we don't, we don't center therapy as a necessity. We, we, we talk about it as a luxury. We talk about it as a privilege because economically in the United States, it is economically around the world. Therapy is a privilege, but in terms of relational health, it's not, it's a necessity. We also in the United States, and you've heard me rant about this. We are obsessed with the myth of individuality as strength. Yeah. And we are absolutely obsessed. And then in a lot of other places, we're incredibly obsessed with like what other people will think. Mm -hmm. So we won't be real because what will they think of me? So mm -hmm. all of those are systemic, but I would say at the core of it, you can get away with not dealing with personality types quite as much at work mm -hmm. because we can all perform a little bit or there's more people in the conversation. So there's more people on the team. You can offset some things. You kind of rub up against each other in a different way. Also, you're all focused on a task and most marriages don't have a task. Like we don't, Correct. we don't have a thing you're working towards. Parents lose communication with each other because your entire life is, is caught up in parenting. Yes. Those of us that aren't parents don't necessarily have a goal we're working for. We're not in a project together unless you understand that your relationship is the project. Yes, uh, exactly. I mean, cause that, that's to me key. That's one of the yeah. five elements of relationship alchemy that I teach is that you want to know what your relationship is for yeah and and what you're individually you know you got to have your individual sense of of where you're going and what you want and the relationship itself i call it the the union or the right. third body it's been called the third body in poetry but there's there's an uh well entity is not my favorite word but there's a third thing that's yeah. created by two people coming together, which is the relationship. And it lives and breathes according to how you put attention into it and how yeah. you approach it. And there's times where your relationship might be asking of each of you or one of you something different than what you're necessarily innately prepared to give. Like you might have your idea of this is how we should do it. But the relationship is over here on the side going, hey, it's actually neither of your things. It's this third thing that if you could come to that agreement, if you could get curious enough about what the union needs, about what the relationship needs, you you discover a whole other thing that you, neither one of you thought of alone. Yeah, so, and it, yeah. I, that's so important because, I mean, I think one of the reasons we don't get as bogged down in work is because tasks shift. Yes. And so the, it, it naturally on a team, you know, people kind of ebb and flow. And like, we've all done all the teamwork exercises at work, all of us white collar folks where it's like, well, that person's the D and that person's the C and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and in our life life, it's just such a different dynamic. And I would yeah. say as well that 
um, my Aaron, my business partner and best friend, and I were talking about this a couple of days ago. We don't ever talk really about the fact that when you make a covenant with somebody, it's the beginning of knowledge of that person. It's not the culmination of knowledge of that person. So Aaron and I, I will say all the time, she is my platonic soulmate. Um, so, I mean, the other broken thing that we can talk about is that we expect one human to fulfill all of our needs, which is garbage. Um, well, it's whack. <laughs> and, and it's not, that's not a failure of monogamy. I'm not saying that we should all have open marriages. I'm saying yeah. that we should stop telling children to marry their best friend. Yeah. Um, and open marriages is your own business. I feel like Will and Jada has shown us that it requires quite a lot more communication than they currently have. Um, <laughs> but you know, we should all have, we all need more support than one other person. Yeah. And so I'm very lucky to have two soulmates, a romantic one and a platonic one. And, yeah. and that I That's found ideal, both, really. Yeah. That I found them both at the same time, actually. Um, and we've nurtured our relationship both separately as a triad. They have a friendship together. Like the three of us are kind of a thing. I'm incredibly privileged, incredibly privileged, but I also feel like I was given that because of what was going to be asked of me by the universe. And I was going to need both of them to do yes. what was asked of me. Amen. Um, but like Aaron and I knew each other really well when we started this work. But between 2016, 2017 and now has been a pandemic, several family surgeries, uh, parental illnesses, four TED Talks, seven taglines. Like we just have to keep going. And if we ever feel like I truly, I know Aaron really well. And I can tell you nine days out of 10, how she'll react to something, what's going on. But then that 10th will throw me hmm. and that's, and it's fine. But like, we always start with the base of, I trust that you always love me. So whatever else happens, we can bounce back from, because I trust that you always love me. Even if you're in pain and hurt people, hurt people and all of those things, I can trust your love. And so we can work and love is an active entity. It is patience. It is kindness. It is goodness. It is self selflessness. It is not keeping score. It is all of those really kind of honestly, holy entities of what love actually looks like, because I can trust that they will be patient with me and kind with me and gracious with me on the days I cannot be to myself. Yes. That they yeah. hold who I am for me when I can't find myself. And I'm an anxious ball of, of, of cyclone chaos. Like I'm an anxiety ball all the time. And so I found, so the universe gave me these two people who are preternaturally calm mm, and can, that's amazing. and yeah. can kind of help, kind of help cycle me. And then we've just brought in just meaning about a year ago, a third person to our business who was also a soulmate, mm. who was also this like other person. Eleanor is just like, I mean, I'm out here, you know, in the sparkly snowsuit. And they just kind of keep me grounded, but it's constant work and it's fun and it's, it's joy and it's humility, but the project always feels weightier because it's my, it's my very soul. It's not a KPI. Oh, that's gorgeous. And I want to come back to what you said about really trusting the, their love as the baseline. So no matter what is happening, because this is something very similar to what I teach about starting from a default and being on the same team, mm -hmm. like no matter what you're showing up or how they're showing up in the moment, remembering that you start from same team changes how the conversation goes. And I want you to draw the link because you also said that truism, which is hurt people, hurt people, and, and to me, there's such a link between our capacity in any given moment to extend grace, to extend empathy, to be curious, and the state of our nervous system, because I too trend toward anxiety. And when I'm an anxious ball, it's really hard for me to have empathy because I'm snarled up in my own chip. <laughs> so how, what have you noticed on a nervous system level around curiosity and empathy? Do you see a link to that too? I do, because the more you practice empathy, the more calming it becomes. Mm. Offline, one of the things that you said was, you know, how do you not have like over compassion fatigue? And I've yes. actually found in the last two years that in consistently choosing curiosity has decreased my anxiety, has prevented compassion fatigue um, in, a, in a time in our history where that would be very easy for me to pick it up. 
um, and has actually centered me more. And the reason I say it is this, the more you understand about the planet, the more you understand how little control you have. <laughs> you have no control over anything but you on any given day. That's it. And so That's much it. of at least my anxiety and the anxiety of the people I've talked to and, and Aaron and I talk about this a lot is like, what is the, what is the effect of, of empathy? And we're all like, you sleep better at night, believe it or not. <laughs> like the more, you know, the more your perspective is richer. So I've talked to, to, I had a conversation with a couple of family members a couple um, months ago and it was kind of at the height of will, will Putin invade? Will Putin not invade? And they were, and I, my pr very pragmatic self, I was like, pals, he's going to invade. <laughs> That's just, he's going to do it. So why are we debating this? But okay, you need to, amazing. And they kind of said all of the things they're afraid about, all of these like really global existential things. This is going to be the collapse of the European Union and like all these things. And it was really emotional language. And they said, aren't you terrified? And I said, no. And they kind of like got really judgy with me and were like, well, how can you not be terrified? That must mean you're not plugged in. And I said, well, I spent three hours yesterday learning about the Maori people of Ethiopia who are being exploited by Western tourists and they're, and they've lost their culture except as a tourist attraction. So is that more or less important than the Somali refugees, than the woman who had like, then the people who couldn't have their families with them at the Olympics, then the stuff in my life, if there is no gradation of trauma and all trauma is trauma, then I have, I can't get panicked about anything because it's all trauma. And yeah. all I can do is love the person in front of me the best I know how. That's my spouse. That's my partner. That's myself. That's my employee. That's the person checking me out at McDonald's. That is the person cutting me off in traffic. That is Vladimir Putin. If he's on my screen, I've got to figure out how to recognize the humanity in whoever is in front of me and give the rest up to the universe because I can't control a damn thing. I have been trying to save this planet since I like was cognizant. <laughs> and the harder I work and the more I focus on how little I'm getting done, the more anxious I get. The more I focus on expanding my understanding, the less anxious I get. Because so much of this is about the proper alignment with the universe. You have to understand that fundamentally, whatever you think created you, it wasn't you. You didn't create you. You have a finite set level of influence. <laughs> and if you can wield it well and holistically and in love, that's all you can control. You can control your reactions. You can control how you deal with things. How many times do we tell that to everybody? Like what well, forgiveness is more for you than for other people. And we never talk about it on a global compassion scale. Mm -hmm. I want you to deeply understand that there is a crisis in the Amazon rainforest right now. Yair Bolsonaro is destroying the planet for funsies. Do you know what I can do about that? Almost nothing. Almost nothing. What I can do is be aware of it. And so when I'm at the grocery store and I think, oh, you know what? I should really buy those recycled paper towels because we're running out of trees. I could sign up for Grove Collective and, and then I could have recycled. Or I, you know what I could do? I could probably make my own laundry detergent. Hmm. I can do that. If an opportunity crosses my desk to donate money to the Amazon fund, I can do that. I've got some extra capital. I can do that. I cannot ride in on the Calvary, assassinate Yair Bolsonaro and recreate the rainforest. Okay. I can't. <laughs> right. So for me, that's what avoids compassion fatigue is actually, because it's not dramatic understanding. This empathy isn't like a pearl clutching, hand wringing, emotional thing. It's very factual and logical. Yeah. This is how the world works. This is how people work. And once you understand more, you also understand your own limitations. And I think that frees us up to love more deeply. Beautifully said. I got to, I'm like, preach, <laughs> can I get an amen? That's what's happening over here. I feel like, I feel like I'm, I'm probably sounding too trite being like, well, I've solved compassion fatigue, but I think I kind of have. <laughs> like, I'm a social worker. I've been at, trying to ask this question for years. For years. Yeah. I mean, as someone who's been in client care or patient care for over 20 years, I mean, that's something that I've also had to figure out. Like, how do you deeply love people and support them 
in their ups and their downs. And, and then there are days you can't. And like, and that's one of the other days, things. There are days you get yeah, to tap out. Then where you need to tap out. Yeah. You and how out. do you disengage at the end of the day and live your life? Also. Exactly. Like you tap mm-hmm. out and we yeah. all have our own things. And the other thing that we need to, that I have not brought up, but I know is a core principle of your work and of my work is non-judgment. Yeah. Non-judgment of self, non-judgment of love. So like part of understanding empathy is like when Erin and I work together, she's got to tap out a lot faster than me. Mm. That doesn't make me better than her or stronger than her or, Amen. or anything else. She has, I can handle more sensory input than she can. That's just fact. I yeah. like more sensory input. I am the person that cannot just watch television. I don't have a box to understand how anyone can focus on one thing at, t- at a time. Mm. That stresses me out and gives me anxiety. I get really bored and I go into my head and it's really bad. But I can be playing a card game on my phone and watching television, and then I'm quite content. Aaron so can do one or the know. other. Yeah. And that's, so good to know. that's yeah. not judgment. That's just life. Yeah. Well, that's and just so self-knowledge. Tap, yeah. So like Aaron says, I got to tap out today. I'm not like, well, she's not a good empathy educator. I'm like, good, yeah. good job taking care of you. I'll see you when you can tap back in. Amen. Absolutely. So what's the best way for people to learn? This is all going to be in the show notes, folks, but I want you to also just say in case someone's driving and they can hear it and internalize it. What's the best way for some for people to learn more about your work and connect with you? Our easiest website is our homepage, which is argooddoctors.com. You can also Google Abby Research if you spell Abby with an E. Um, We're on YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn. We're all over the show. So remember argooddoctors.com and remember Abby Research with an E. Beautiful. Thank you so much. It's been awesome to talk with you today. I just love our conversations and I can't wait to see you again. Same.